Decolonizing the Mind was published in 1986, written by Ngugi Wati Ongo upon his observation of the deterioration of African languages in favor of the European ones such as English, French, and Portuguese. Decolonizing the Mind is an argumentative magnum opus of sound reasoning. It seeks to address and condemn the replacement of African languages in modern African social circles. As to Ngugi, in order to truly be free of the legacy of colonization, all native Africans must reject foreign languages as a dominant medium of communication. This compelling essay touches on themes such as colonization, neocolonization, decolonization, for loss of culture, identity, the meaning of progress, and of course, the theory of language. The book boasts of two chapters. The language of African literature, the language of African theater, the language of African fiction, and the quest of relevance. Gugi drew his inspiration from his imprisonment and exile following his production of a controversial 1977 play, Ngahika Nda Inde, that had challenged the authoritarian status quo in Kenya at the time. Written in the style of a collection of very strong and compelling essays about how languages are used to mentally cage its victims even after colonization, the essays establish the importance of languages and linguistic freedom, the highly underrated importance of language in any culture. Ngugi believes it is not only a way of speaking to him, but language is in fact a bridge that connects the speakers to such cornerstone aspects such as the people's memory, their historical practices, their customs, their values, their ancestors. Native languages are truly the most that reflect the rhythmical nuances of African life. Using strong historical evidence, decolonizing the mind explains brilliantly how the diminishing of one's language is also the simultaneous disintegration of all African values it uses actual historical context of how languages have played and still play a critical role in distancing the colonized from their original culture and ways of life. Gugi observes that in every imperial setting, language has to be imposed for it to succeed to render the strong psychological chain upon the colonized. This is not by coincidence, but it's because the colonizers have found that forcing their own language upon the natives is one of the best ways they could cut them from their sense of self and in turn become submissive to them. To develop an inferiority complex that would prevent them from challenging their settlers from seizing their native ancestral lands, which of course worked. The essay observes that the African cultural deterioration in the face of the loss of its native languages is not by coincidence, but a carefully constructed process, a careful colonial process that was so efficient that it lasted to even today, called neocolonialism. With this book, Ngugi highlights just how crucial language preservation is. As he puts it, Communication between human beings facilitates the evolution of a culture, he argues, but language also carries the histories, values, and aesthetics of culture along with it. As he puts it, language as culture is the collective memory bank of a people's experience in history. So once this bridge is burned, the natives are robbed of their sense of belongings as dignified human beings on this earth, he writes. Colonial alienation is like the separation of the mind from the body so that they are occupying two unrelated linguistic spheres in the same person. On a larger scale, it is like producing a society of bodiless heads and headless bodies, he argues in decolonizing the mind. The book vividly explains the importance of our native cultural languages as Africans do respect their history and identity. As he puts it, the use of language is central to a people's definition of themselves in relation to the entire universe. Gugi even criticizes other authors who use foreign languages as quote fostering a neocolonial mentality. And further comments that language as communication and as culture are then products of each other. Communication creates culture. Culture is a means of communication. Language carries culture and culture carries particularly through orature and literature, the entire body of values by which we come to perceive ourselves and our place in the world. Gugi also argues that 
It is artists and writers who possess the ability to transform the images that African peoples come to identify with by producing works of art and literature in their mother tongue. So it really does not make sense to him for native stories to be told in the foreign alien language. He believes that it is not possible to create a distinct African identity and culture by continuing to use English as the language of instruction in schools. In this regard, the message of this book is pretty clear. Gugi believes simply writing or speaking in your native tongue is part and parcel of the imperialist struggle that is meant to protect our culture. So this book is relevant to this modern social media setting where many youth seems to be completely disposing their traditional languages in favor of the foreign colonial ones. It directly condemns the use of foreign languages to tell African stories, let alone to abandon the native languages in their entirety. As to Ngugi, all Africans who reject their cultural language are imprisoned, subconscious and submissive servants to the new colonial empire. However, Ngugi is not against the teaching of other languages to children at all. What he is trying to convey is that it's only after the child is able to feel the harmony between his own language, his own culture, and the world around him, he would be able to then be in a position to approach other people's literature and languages without any sense of inferiority complexes about his own languages, self, and environment. Thus, this book is not all cynical. The call for rediscovery of and the resumption of our African languages is a call for a regenerate reconnection with the millions of revolutionary tongues in Africa and the world over search for liberation. Ironically, he praises the downtrodden proletariat class as opposed to the bourgeoisie, the peasants and the workers. He insists that while the indigenous African languages have been attacked by imperialism, they have survived largely because they are kept alive by the workers, peasantry and those in the rural areas who kept and still are speaking them even today. By practicing such important pre-colonial traditions such as oral tradition, storytelling at times, and still and still has hopes that change will only happen when the proletariat is empowered by their own language and culture and they somehow gain power. This book is a focal point of the ongoing debate in academic circles of whether English and other colonial languages should continue to be taught in African schools dubbed as the language debate or the African language debate. It's a complicated discussion. That is why we created a full special edition on the whole issue. You can watch it when you go through this link to watch the MIMSI special edition dedicated to the language debate. If you have an African novel you want to see Dudu summarize, do not hesitate to comment below. Don't forget to subscribe for more original great Afrocentric content like this. Thanks for watching MIMSI Dudu summaries.